thank you very much for inviting me. I'm incredibly thrilled and excited and honored to be here and to have your attention and your ears this morning. So it's a privilege for me. This talk is absolutely brand new. So it's, um, I pulled it together for today's session and it is based on a model we have been developing and we're gonna say who we is in a second. And I just wanna see how it lands with you guys. So maybe it doesn't land, I've been making this joke and maybe you're gonna throw it back to me right afterwards. That's fine, it's better you than you do. So um, <laughs> thank you very much for this invitation, for the, for the opportunity to speak today about this interesting topic as well and how this all fits so, so, yes. Right, so who is, oh, this, how I start? Probably this is how I start. So who is, this thing is still based on work I've been doing together with Katarina Kluck and Peter Kreet and Michelle Good. We've just written a chapter, a book chapter about the model that I'm going to present. As Lisa mentioned, I've been using social identity in the last couple of years to explain the effects of job insecurity, unemployment, dramatic changes to work. And I think it is a very, very helpful model for us to understand these these pervasive experiences that people have. And I've had the luck that, to have really lovely collaborators. Some of them are in the audience today. Just a few picture shots, headshots, and there would be more on those slides. So just to show, it's not just this strange woman telling you these things, but there are other people who believe in these ideas as well, or who have been at least interested enough to toy around with. So this is, I'm not alone. Um, I'm working with other people, and this work is work in progress, work in development. Okay, so the next 40 minutes or so, I think, I, have, I looked up in the program, I have an hour. That's a wide <laughs> including questions, all right? So, so I think I will keep it at roughly 40 minutes. Sometimes I have the tendency to talk too fast, sometimes I have the tendency to dwell too long on certain slides. Um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, so in the next 40 minutes, I'm gonna give you a very brief introduction to precarious work. We've heard about, about that before, so it's gonna be short. But then I'm also gonna give a brief lecture <laughs> introduction into work identity. This is such a vast field, so it's important to, to clarify where I come from, because talking about identity is sometimes like stepping into a wasp's nest, and you step on the toes of very many different scholars and different approaches, so it's important to clarify that. And then I'm gonna bring it all together, and I'm Introduce to you the idea that precarity could be seen as an identity threat. And then at the end, I've had some slides because today is also what can we do and what can we do as academics. So um, I'll discuss a little bit about that. And for those quantitatively minded scholars among you, I have some fantastic measurement suggestions. I'm a quantitative scholar, I should send this. Um, I, I really appreciate qualitative work, I work with qualitative scholars but I would not be the right person to do qualitative research myself. So that's basically the angle of where I'm coming from. Okie dokie. I thought it's always really cool to start um, a lecture like this with a quote from a Nobel Prize winner, right? So then you know, yes, I'm on the right side. These people like Am Amari Tetzel um, also say that. So basically, uh, in his, one of his keywords, he says that, well, an impoverished life is one without freedom to undertake important so it's basically an opportunity restriction, right? So poverty, precarity, restricts us from leading a dignified life, from acting in the ways that we need to act. And this is the key aspect that I want to focus on. Okay, so let's keep that in mind, and um, I think this is interesting for us as psychologists. Okay, so just to make the case that we are talking about something really important here. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the American Community Survey conducted by the APA every year. It's a representative survey of US American adults. And one question that teachers in there is, what stresses you most in your life? And the interesting thing that comes out on top again and again and again is worries about money, about finances. And so you can go back, this is 2022 data, you can go back to 15, I don't know how long the archive stretches, and you will always find worries about money right on top there. <coughs> money or work, work or money, but it's like it's like one or two, right? This top thing, and for me as a work psychologist, what fascinates me is we do not see a similar amount of publications on worries about money, right? We have stress research that talks about 
stress from job demand, stress from job insecurity, stress from work life, family balance, etc., etc. Then you were mentioning stress about how to pay your bills. So I sometimes think we're looking at the elephant in the room here, right? It's such a big, big stressor, but we're not calling it out, we're not tapping it. So it is an issue, of course, and it is even increasingly so an issue. This is something really, you know, if you read these data, it just draws all the breath out of you, right? Um, inflation is the source of stress for 83% of US adults, 83% of the representative survey that they have done. So 57% um, have time with difficulties paying money and flipping in the present or reported feeling saving that the money to save. So, so it is a huge issue, and perhaps, perhaps because it is the times of inflation at the moment, <coughs> not the cost of living crisis, that, that we are also here, and that there is now a regained focus on the issue of poverty, precarity, and money worries. So you see, I use the terms precarity rather loosely. And um, this is perhaps something to clarify also. So I'm talking about precarity. Precarity, however, is informed, of course, mostly by precarious work. So I'm looking at precarity at adult time, informed by precarious work. Um, sometimes precarity or a precarious background leads into precarious work, defined as by Nick Allen as employment that is low in remuneration, security, flexibility with uncertain and poorly protected working conditions. So basically, the the term precarious work, I, as I understand it, is work that comprises of all of these features. Um, poorly paid, insecure, inflexible, bad <coughs> labor conditions. Um, and apparently it affects a very large percentage of people in the labor market. Um, okay, so, right, so this is, this is basically the background and the thing we're dealing with. Uh, we know that precarious work has tremendous consequences on people. So first of all, it leads to precarious living. Um, there is plenty of studies out there that show us that people who earn too little money also live less well. So they spend, for example, more money on, on the daily amenities than you would as a rich person. So for example, as a richer person, you would own a washing machine. As a poorer person, you have to go to the laundromat to do your washing. You might think, well, what's the difference, right? Well, the difference is you have to go there. It takes time to get there. You have to sit down there. You have to wait for your washing there. This is all time that you're not productive, meaning earning money to get by or looking after your children or cleaning your house or doing any other duty that you have in your life. So actually leading a poorer life is a more time-consuming life also. We have in the UK this uh, really, I think, despicable system of the prepaid gas meters and prepaid electricity meters. So people on a very low income are not given a contract by the gas or electricity company. Instead, they're given a little machine where they have to buy a prepaid card, which they then enter the machine. But the rates for gas and electricity are way higher than they are for if you have a normal contract with a gas or electricity company. So basically, classic lines would theory, right? Living poorly means living more expensively over the long term. And then, of course, you have those side effects of being poor, of um, how you cannot afford your chosen mode of transport. So you might say, well, yeah, well, you have an old car, no? But yeah, you have an old car that breaks down more easily, or you have to walk somewhere. Again, it takes time. Um, it, it, there's a, a fantastic um, example by Heiner and Schmaller that they give of the daily hassles that poor people are more exposed to. Basically, imagine you're out in the city and you, it starts raining. A person like us can go and hail a cab and take a taxi home. A person who's poor gets rained off. So you might say, oh, big deal, right? You're getting rained off. But it adds up. No, it's these little, little inconveniences in life that just all accumulate and, and make life more unpleasant, right? Not, not to say that you probably live in a poorer area. That is probably maybe you know in shabby living conditions. Bruna et al. Some Austrian sociologists they interviewed people who were precarious living and how they were coping. And it turns out people turn on they don't turn on the light or they only heat heat one room in their house. And so they 
it really has a massive effect on your living conditions. Um, and we know from, from research that precarity, of course, affects mental health. So this is obvious for us as psychologists. So we know that, um, that this is the one that I was just quoting from the keynote, it's about financial scarcity, the scarcity in daily life and how that affects um, uh, your, your well-being. We have done our own study on a 19-year German panel study. If you want to look up that study in the European Journal of Work and Organizational Psychology, and we found basically that objective measures of precarity, measured as low income under the German um, uh, minimum wage income, uh, and financial and subjective financial precarity, namely financial strain, both independently predict mental health and life satisfaction in a 19-year panel study. So it's, it's a gigantic data set. And what we found was that if people got worse, so if people fell under the poverty line, then their mental health got worse, of course, also their life satisfaction got worse. We controlled for household income here. This was income measured on the individual level. So the interesting thing, just for those of you um, who are interested in these number of things, um, it's not the household income so much, but it was the individual income. If you want to read more and understand more about the experience of poverty, I can recommend you this book by Darren McGarvey. He is um, a hip hop artist, actually. And um, he wrote this book coming himself. He comes from a very, very deprived background. And he wrote this book. In the opening, it says, I've never read a book in my life, and I'm writing a book. So it, it comes from a very courageous point of view. The man, of course, can handle words, right? So he's a wordsmith, basically. It's, it's a really, really impressive account of what it means to live with poverty. And one very prominent quote in here that I've taken out here basically drives home this, this issue of stress, of poverty being stressful. Yes. So it's, uh, in terms of poverty, stress is one of the biggest variables in the equation. If we could reduce stress levels, we would raise the quality of life of the people. So it's the connected tissue between the social problems that are facing this poor and There would be more to say about this one, but I encourage you to find it. So we know poverty, precarity, precarity is bad. We also know for well mental health. Well, that's not, you know, it's not news. We also know it's bad for working. So this is a bit more newer research, but it shows us basically that um, in our, one of our own studies, we're looking at, in a four-way study among British employee people, we're looking at financial worries, so worrying about your finances, and turn over intention in psychological contracts, which means does predict that over time. So people who worry more about their finances are not the ones that cling to their job. Of course, they look for a better job, for a better paying job, right? It makes sense. So an interesting finding. And there's more research of that just recently coming out from a more management perspective. So we find basically, for example, that worrying about finances makes an impact on how you work in the daily environment. So they found an association with accidents, for example. So truck drivers who were more worried about their finances had more accidents. And we also find that um, it's, the argument is basically that, that it undermines performance in highly structured work contexts. So you're worried about how to pay your bills, and in highly structured work contexts where there's full support, low autonomy, um, this might undermine performance. So you know, actually, what are these jobs that are paying so lowly? These are jobs that are often um, very highly structured. There is not jobs where people have the autonomy to show up or to do whatever, uh, whenever they want to do certain things, like, like the privileged jobs that we have but it's often very structured jobs. So ironically, apparently, worries seem to affect particularly those behaviors that are particularly important in those low-level jobs. So it's, it's, a, it's a really un, an unnerving cycle. And we also know that precarity engenders discrimination. So this is an, an experimental study, and it's something probably that many vulnerable people will find resonating, but basically what they found was that there is a prejudice against, uh, against financially precarious people in that they would not perform well and that they would steal from the company and that they would cheat. 
And so this prejudice has then to the effect that supervisors spend more time surveying people who are who they know are financially precarious. And these people are also going to give, be given fewer interesting tasks to do. So there is a definite discriminatory element here as well. Okay, so you know this, right? This is knowledge we have seen before, you know, um, precarity is bad. And we have, the as work psychologists, a wealth of theories available to us to explain those negative effects. <coughs> and uh, yeah, it, would be, it would be disingenuous to, to not mention those theories, right? So we've heard um, the psychology, psychology of working theory yesterday as a general framework, but there are many other theories out there that basically drive home or explain to us why precarity has those negative effects on mental health or on working behavior. Most of them you can see are stress-related theories, right? Appraisal of threat or harm or conservation of resources theory could be used. Or there's theories on um, effort reward imbalance could be used to explain the negative effect of financial precarity. If you, you work so hard and you cannot even afford your living, what does that do to you? Self-determination theory would be another one. Our sense of control is a, is a variable we found mediating between precarity, financial worries, and mental health outcomes in the 19 year study. So when I'm coming here now with my identity, I know you might be going like, yeah, but we have all this already, right? Why do we need another theory, right? How does that, you know, <laughs> we kind of even agree on these ones, and you want to throw in another one into the mix. So, well, my argument here is basically that these are important explanatory models to explain the immediate effect of precarity on individuals' experience. What they cannot do so well, in my opinion, is explain the long-term scarring effect that precarity has on people. Because it's an interesting thing. Having experienced precarity myself, for example, at one earlier time in my life, it is something that doesn't leave you so easily. So what is it that precarity does that has those long-term scaring effects, even if you're long, no longer scared of precarious yourself? So I think it does something very fundamental to you. And this is why I think we need to look at fundamental, more fundamental root concepts in psychology. And this is what identity is to you. So this is why I would like to suggest us, I'm not saying these are not valid, on the contrary, right? When it comes to immediate mental health outcomes and behavioral outcomes, do look into stress themes, for example, basically, right? Um, worries is stressful, will distract, distract you, you know, it's not news. But when it comes to understanding perhaps goal setting or future career perspectives or what people dare to do in their lives, then perhaps identity might be more helpful. So, oh, yeah. So, my basic proposition, I'm gonna take it all away right now, and then you can forget about it, and then I'm coming back slowly, I'm going to build up slowly to this, basically. So that's the main, the main proposition is already here, right? My main proposition is that precarity restricts opportunity. Opportunity to act, to get appreciation, and to self-reflect, build a self-reflecting narrative. This is important, because not having these opportunities will undermine your self-understanding, your understanding of who you are, or threaten existing understanding. This, again, is not good news, because if you do not have a good, stable understanding of who you are, it affects who you think you can be, who you want to be, where you want to go. If you guys doubt your abilities as work psychologies, then what's the next career step? maybe by school career, right? So it's, right? It's, if you start doubting yourself, it, it really questions the future. Okay, forget all that now. I'm going to come back to this very, very slowly. So it's not just me being mentally a bit weird um, suggesting that identity might be an important element in this whole precarity cycle. And all the other people, and I have copied this from the article you're probably all familiar with, but Blake Allen, 2021 in JVP, where he says, well, identity is an important outcome of precarity. And I agree, but I would go a bit further and say, 
it is not just another outcome, it is the root concept. And it can inform action, it can inform behavior, and it can inform our being. And this is what makes it so interesting to me. So I, I don't want to say, look, this is now the new all, and forget everything that's come, have come before, but it is an interesting way of looking. Okay, so let's take it slowly. Why, first of all, why has social identity been? Social identity, in my opinion, is a very, very useful concept because it bridges basically the social context, experiences that people make in a social context with actual behavior, cognition, effect that people show. So it's one, this is a fantastic feature of social identity because um, so basically it can explain a wide range of things, behaviors, cognitions, effect, and um, it's also connected very much to you know, the social context. So who you are is informed by where you are at, coming to that in a moment. And also, this means, by doing that, by structuring this kind of thinking, it allows us to point out blind spots. And maybe look at the situation in a new angle, perhaps identify new questions, maybe find ways of structuring existing, maybe contradicting findings better. So it's basically like a really good lens and a really good perspective my opinion, but I'm a fan, so what can I say? Okay, so let me introduce to those of you who are not so familiar when I say social identity, with what is that exactly, right? And I'm a social psychologist, so for me this is of course clear, but not everybody might be as clear. So this is my one lecture, one slide lecture on social identity, basically. Um, and what do I mean with that? Uh, so it's based on, of course, Tashville and Turner's writings and Turner's social self-categorization theory but applied to organizations. And there has been some really, really great stuff going on by Blake Ashford and colleagues who applied this type of thinking to the situation at work. And so most easily expressed identity is the answer to the question, who are you? And all of us can give different answers to that, right? But the work context lends itself to give a wide range of answers. So I can say, Okay, my name is Eva Selenko. I work at Loughborough University. Right? I'm a professor in work psychology. Um, I am the head of the work organization group. So I can define myself in various belongings to different organizational or occupational groups. I can say I'm an editor of a journal. Right? All of these things are social categories. So you have, when I say I'm a professor, everybody of us has a stereotypical idea of what a professor is. Right? So you're like, ah, she's one of that group and so on, right? And these groups are overlapping. I'm also an Austrian, of course. I am a, um, I don't know. I have, there, there are many categories that we have. Not all of them are work-related, obviously. So, but since we spend most of our time at work, it's very likely that we will, you know, when we say who we are, think of ourselves of where we spend most time, which is at work. So in, it makes much sense to say like, well, all these work-related identities make a big chunk of the general pool of identity that we all consist of. So um, obviously it depends how you say who you are, it depends on the context. When I'm on the beach learning how to surf, I'm not gonna say, oh, I'm a professor in art psychology. They will not, this is not gonna help with my surfing lesson. So, right, okay. So work identity, I call it work identity because it makes it easier, basically is the pool of all possible social self-categorizations in terms of work. You could even say, I'm a diligent worker. Right? So that's, you could say, it's a very personal category, but even then you have a social idea of what the diligent person, diligent worker is. And these categories, these social self-categorizations reinforce our expectations, our norms, our thoughts, our emotions, and behavior. A simple example, if you define yourself as, as a journalist, even if you're self-employed, then you do know what the journalist's work is, what it entails, where you should look for clients, what the career progression is as a journalist, and you know what, what the journalist does and what he or she doesn't do. So it informs expectations and norms. And social psychologists, See, this is a very cognitive construct. But research in work psychology has found this is not purely cognitive. It's not just, you know, you sitting down and going like, I think I'm a journalist. <laughs> That's not how it works, right? You have to do certain things to become certain things. So 
work identities, I'm flanked by an accident, right? Can you see yourself as a journalist if you don't get any jobs, if you don't get published? Are you an author if you do not write anything? Or if you don't get published, if your books don't get published? I think we all have these points in our career where we try to get certain ideas published and no one wants them, right? Are you still, can you still call yourself a researcher or having a creative idea if no one wants to publish it, for example? So if you're not doing it, are you really it? So basically, enactment is a core component of who we are. What is, I am what I do. Sense-making of that is then another component. So we find, for example, in studies among um, deprived youth in London boroughs who are sent on apprenticeships that um, people are sent on an apprenticeship but they eat on an apprenticeship with network rail, for example. Before that, people are like, network rail? What do I do with network rail, right? That's the company that runs the rail services in the UK. I don't see myself as working for network rail. Then they spend a day or two with network rail and they're actually like, oh yeah, okay, ooh. Yeah, I, I can see myself doing that, right? And I actually, so they form a narrative, they make sense of that. We had people coming back who were like, you know, I, I, they told me I have, I have leadership skills. I, I didn't even know I have leadership skills. So you enact a behavior, you look back on it like, wow, I did that, that's amazing. And you get social validation by others for it. And that kind of informs who you think you are. So, so there is a very, there is these three components, and it's not just me saying that, of course, right? Um, so look up this fantastic paper, it's one of my favorites, Ash Rinchin of 2016, and you were um, organizational psychology, I think. So basically, in order for identity to form, we need to do it, do behavior associated with that identity, make sense of it, form a narrative around it, um, and get validation from others for it. So it's not just a cognitive idea, it is actually involved in doing things. It's doing things, enacting them, and then you are them. Um, otherwise it becomes a bit of delusion, right? I'm a race car driver. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's these three components. So, okay. And you can, of course, you, you know where I'm going with this, right? You know that I'm going to then outline how precarity is going to affect these things but that's gonna come a few slides later. I'm gonna take a step back now to convince you again why this is important to look at. Because we found in plenty of studies that identity is relevant for work. And um, so we, we know from studies by Strauss, for example, and George and Strauss, that how you see yourself and how you see yourself in the future influences your career goal setting. These are quantitative studies. Really interesting to look at. Um, we know that Knowing where you belong occupation-wise, organization-wise, job-wise, job role-wise, sets norms and sets approach to typical expectations. We know that it provides a sense of self-reference, so for belonging. If you know, I'm a work psychologist, I belong to EWOP, I'm a member of EWOP. So if there's a new topic out on, let's say, COVID and the world of work, who am I going to turn to? I'm gonna turn to my professional bodies. They're gonna see what they have to say about this. So, because I belong to this group, right? I, and that's where I go for support. I also, of course, belong to other groups and build my confidence with other groups. But so this has a practical function, actually. Um, there are measured health and well-being effects because if you know whom you belong to, then you know whom to turn to for support. So that, that's one of the things. So there's a positive effect of, of being part of, um, of having a, a clear work-related identities. That's such a complicated thing, right? We're multiple things. I call it only in singular form. Oh God. Um, so, but you need to have a clear understanding of this pool of who you are and who you can be because it has these positive side effects of knowing where to go, knowing who to turn to for support, etc. What happens if it's threatened? Oh, plenty of bad things happen. And there is, you know, of course, tons of social psychology libraries full of experimental studies showing us that well, it's going to be negative for your emotion. It's going to have 
but it's also going to have all these negative effects, right, of not knowing where to go in your career, but it's also going to have some very interesting social effects. So people apparently who are threatened in their identity as a member of a group start to denigrate out groups, at least in the experiments, to feel better about their in-group, right? So let's say Lovegrass sinks in its rankings at universities. I might go like and say, well, oh, this time's higher education ranking there. Yeah, they're just uh, a political concept anyway. And uh, I think we would offer a much better working environment than the university of higher ranking, whoever that is, so for example. I'm not sure it really works like that. And I have not found evidence for that, but that's at least on paper. This will potentially help us here. So you might, it might affect your thinking about other groups, about other people. You know, stereotype research, Rebrand School and, and colleagues uh, in social psychology showing us that. Okay. So, and we actually found some evidence for that. So we found evidence that a threatened identity can have an effect on how you think about other people in society. Um, whether you tolerate people of other ideas. So uh, how tolerant are you towards other ideas as an element of social dominance orientation? We measured that as a flexible concept, actually. And we found, this is a study um, I conducted with Hans de Witte. Basically, what we were looking at here was job insecurity as a threat to the identity as an employed person. Because job insecurity is, is you know, you might be employed or you might be unemployed in a few, in a few months' time. So it's quite a, an identity threat to your self-understanding as a worker. And we were thinking, well, if that's really so pervasive, then that might lead to more conservative attitudes, meaning thoughts of anti-egalitarianism, that is, your tolerance towards people who are different. It wasn't politically defined as red and white, red and left. It was not, there was no, it was a neutral type of measurement of do you tolerate people who think differently to yourself. And we find that people who were threatened, identified less with the working population because of job insecurity, also showed more anti-egalitarianism. It's a really interesting thing because it was the first study that shows a connection between job insecurity, perceived job insecurity, identity as a member of the working population, and thinking politically, if you want to call it thinking politically, or like society, right? In terms of society. We also measured left and right wing didn't correlate, because obviously you could, you could say, well, we could be more right-wing and then not be tolerant towards left-wing, and you could be more left-wing and not be tolerant towards right-wing. So it's it's a thing that is not really aligned with political left and right. So there is evidence on that. So basically, okay, we have we have those negative effects of identity threat. So what I'm going to propose here is precarity is going to affect identity. And the first proposition is that precarity and precarious work restrict opportunity for enactment, sense making, and social validation. Okay. Is there any evidence for this? There is. We know that precarious jobs are by nature agency restricting because they pay low. Okay, we can argue that. But also, they have often unpredictable work conditions, unpredictable schedules, and they are often not just one job, but people have to run multiple jobs. So you were enacting this type of job, then you're enacting that type of job. They're often looked down upon by others, seen as less valuable. So you're enacting it, a profession of cleaning, for example, that's not necessarily societal appreciated that, that much. So you're enacting something that not necessarily informs a positive light on yourself. This is an, you know, a stigmatized job. And often precarious work is also conducted in isolation unstable. You do not form the social relationships that are necessary to get social appreciation. If you're a shift worker and your shift changes constantly, your team changes. So whom do you get, from whom do you get appreciation from? This is a stock photo and this person is apparently happening in this picture. Um, so okay, so first of all, precarious work restricts opportunity to enact behaviors that might inform a competent understanding of you know, a forward-looking work-related identity. Also, okay, and it might, it might restrict um, sense-making, it might restrict these factors of social validation, right? So it's conducted in isolation, often without the appreciation that is needed. For example, cleaners, 
are often cleaning offices when managers and normal office workers are not around. So their work is invisible, and they do not get the normal recognition that other workers would get who show up during the day, for example. So you're not even seeing property. Okay. Second proposition. Restricted enacting sense making sort of social validation, so the restriction of this makes identity development more difficult and threatens existing identity. So you cannot do what you think needs to be done in order to be a good professor, journalist, teacher, um, cleaner. Um, and this threatens your existing identity driver. Okay, there is some evidence for this. So if I think, for example, this is a fantastic study, one of my favorites at the moment, Patrick Lieri, next 2019, uh, Administrative Science Quarterly, ASQ. Um, it's basically a qualitative study among precarious artists. And so you have to imagine, these are people self-employed, calling themselves artists, but not getting exhibitions, not getting paid. So not getting the recognition that you would hope to get as an artist. So are you still an artist? These people are still calling themselves artists and still define themselves as artists. Because they've, so they struggle financially, of course. But they, they managed a way, creative way, to, to still define themselves as artists. For example, by finding a community of people who say, like, well, we're not mainstream artists, we're alternative artists. Um, by finding communities that gave them appreciation. By finding experiences of purpose routines, even routines in terms of place. So they still manage to define themselves as artists, despite not being you know, patrons, not having exhibitions, etc. But it costed them effort. It was not something that, oh yeah, sure, I'm an artist. No, they had to redefine themselves, and they had to constantly make this clear towards others. For me, this here smells very much like Jehovah's Lighting function. They do not mention this in this paper. But it seems like if those artists could create situations where they felt purpose, social contact, recognition, then they felt more clearly about themselves. So that's just a side thought. Okay, there is another nice study, also another one I love at the moment. This is by Chessy Kuhn and Ben Peeble. And basically, um, in order to become someone, you need to develop an aspirational future, an aspirational idea of who you could be in the future. But how can you do that? You come from a, from a background of precarity where there's no, no idea of who you could perhaps be in the future. So this is um, a study among deprived young adults, teenagers, who were by chance signed up to an apprenticeship with Jamie Oliver. So this is the, the study, you know, they, it was big in the 2000s, basically, um, a canteen, a social canteen where people, apprenticeship, learned chef's profession. And Kuhn and Jesse Kuhn and uh, Uti Claire and colleagues, they pulled those people up and interviewed the apprenticeship over several points of time. And what they found was that, so first of all, these were just randomly, like, they landed this apprenticeship by chance. They didn't like sign up and put their hands up for it. But by doing the apprenticeship over time, they got new self-understandings of who they could potentially be and, and, and who they could be as a competent person. So this shows us again that by doing certain things, sometimes just randomly slipping into an apprenticeship, you can build a new self-understanding. You're doing new things. You haven't done this before. So you're doing a new thing. You get recognition for it. You're like, wow, I'm a chef. Um, okay, not that magically you had this happen, but you're doing it, getting recognition for it, which forms this identity. And this, of course, can also tell you, well, in the world of work, I could work in a restaurant. Before that, that was not in your head. Okay, third point, right? So do we find any evidence for this? Yes, um, we do find any evidence that I've done several studies myself on the effect of job insecurity on identity. So we do see that um, if there are precarious situations like job insecurity, for example, it undermines a person's identity, in this case, as employed persons, a very, very broad category. And then this leads to negative things. If you want to read more about this, I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, we published this in 2017. It has negative effects on well-being. Four-wave study of stable effects. Anna Mekikangas and Chris Stride are fantastic statisticians, so you can rely on the data to, uh, to tell the story. We even find that if your job changes dramatically, 
it might affect, again, your identification. And that might affect things wider outside of work, like um, compliance with COVID strategies. This is a paper me and I have been trying to write up or have written up and trying to get published. But people also not find it very interesting, apparently. So um, I find it very interesting. So we do see that identity plays a role, and it can be threatened by changes to work, by precarity, um, and that that has consequences. So I'm going to try to kind of wrap this up. Proposition three is um, if we do not have these things, lack of positive, stable identity, it will have effects on well-being, action, and beliefs and expectations. So a little bit of what I've shown before already. And we do find evidence from this in qualitative research, so specifically now to the area of precarity. Um, we find that there is reduced task performance at work. And in that study I've been I'm writing up at the moment with Australian gig economy workers. We found that those people, those gig economy workers who it was among Uber drivers, who did not identify as drivers, were less likely to speak up to the organization. But however, those Uber drivers who identified as drivers, they had a very clear idea of what it means to be a driver, what a driver should be treated like, and where this, you know, and hence they had expectations they could speak up to. So for us, this shows that um, precarious work or vulnerable work, like gig economy work, does not necessarily lead to a clear identity as a driver, for example. But if you still have that, then you're more likely to, for example, know what your expectations are, what your rights are, what you deserve, and what you should speak up to. From an organizational point of view, the voice is very important for organizational process and gig economy employers might miss out if they do not provide the opportunities of people to form an identity, and Uber doesn't in this case. So we found this, for example, drivers saying, well, we don't even have a room to meet. We don't have an office to go to. There's no place to hang out. You have no shared community. But some people were drivers before they started working for Uber, and they did have that community already brought in. Okay, so bringing it all together, we're calling it the precarity identity process model. It's a long word and probably not the best word for it. But we're saying, well, okay, precarious work limits opportunity for enactment, sense making, social validation. This, in turn, um, is important. This can reinforce or threatened, right? Working at work identities, most broadly speaking, meaning your identity as you know, in your occupation, your job, your organization, you name it, but I, I take this as a broad term. That in turn, however, informs things like, well, well-being, but also goal expectations, norms, performance, and perhaps even wider political thinking. So we need more evidence, of course, here. And then you might wonder, is that possible? Right, so, so you have someone, the unpublished journalist, the, not, the, the artist without ex exhibition, um, the gig economy hustler who doesn't really know which job profile, career, occupational community they belong to, they might have unclear goals of where to go next. Just probably grabbing the next job maybe to, to fill their financial needs. So, so this is the question, I think. I hope this helps thinking about precarity, because I, what I want to do with this model is kind, kind of like help us lay a bridge around how the experience of a certain context might actually lead to certain behaviors, thinking, well-being. OK, so right. I wanted to have discussion, and there's key message to be had. You know them already. Precarity is an opportunity. Precarity and opportunity, precarious work comes with less opportunity, and that leads to identity threat. Identity threat leads to negative outcomes. Where do I see it in relation to all these theories? I think identity is a root concept. It doesn't deny all those other explanations, but it is just something. So I'm not saying, you know, oh, you're getting paid less and you're going to wonder who you are. No, you're going to be paid less and you wonder how to pay your bill tomorrow. That's your primary concern. But over the longer term, Looking back at you, oh, who do you do? What do you do as a career? I don't have a career. So, 
There's that. What can we do? Researchers? We need to gather more evidence. We need to cast also the net of our consequences wider. So if, per if we understand precarity as such a pervasive experience that it will affect our identity, then this means that it will affect other aspects, not just well-being, not just work behavior. Maybe our thinking in wider society. It's a potential, right? It's a possibility. So consider money worries and identity threat in your studies. If you're a quantitative researcher, it's very easy. I'm going to show you that. How policymakers, what can we do? How about poverty? Create opportunities for enactment, for self-reflection, for policy validation. Because that's what qualitative studies seem to show us, that people need those opportunities. Think of the Kuhn study, for example. What can we do as citizens? We should be educating ourselves and understanding and being empathic towards people in precarity. These are two fantastic books. If you want to understand the experience of precarity, this it could have been a bit of a But this is a really good book also. So um, do check these two out, these two authors. Um, how do we do it as a researcher? If you're quantitative persons, there is very easy ways to measure financial worries. So we have published this in Social Science and Medicine in 2011, so you could use this. It always works, it's fantastic. The biggest correlation with mental health you can think of, you know, we have gender, education, age, and so on with mental health in there. You would find tiny, tiny correlations. Ask this, you find huge correlations. So very easy to measure, measure money worries. So there's no excuse on not be measuring. Identity, yes, it can be measured. There is this thing from Doshi, 1995, I think it's quoted 4,000 times or something, so you can adapt this to the type of identity you want to measure. We can even measure identity threat now. There's this recent paper out just in July 2023 in Journal of Applied Psychology on how to measure identity threat, and it's exactly similar to what I just said, like it's what to our enactment and, and, and so I think there's no excuse for us not to measure. That's all I have to say for today. Um, thank you very much for listening. I talked too long. Um, and I'm very curious about your comments and thoughts. Thank you. creating your own in-group. So maybe we need to ask people, do they have a community online that they share with, for example? You know, a, a, a community of the struggling artists who are now cleaners or so. Um, because I think there is support groups for almost anything nowadays. And you wonder whether that then helps navigating challenges towards, for example, the question of identity. I don't, I don't know, I have no answer to that, but it's a super good idea. Yes, please. Yeah, first of all, I thought this was a fantastic presentation, so you should feel great. This is definitely something that's going to make a big difference. Thank you very um, much. So two thoughts. One is, have you done research on uh, whether uh, work identity is differentiated against other psychological variables like well-being? Mm. stability of things and when we first um, measured identification with the working population it was like a, a 
a real stack thing, to, you know, if it was a stack. I had this idea, but you never know whether it worked out, and it works out data-wise perfectly. But also conceptually, I think, it depends on what you mean by well-being. So if we look at emotional, I, I look at um, affective well-being. So basically, how well did you sleep last night? Do you have a lot of worries? Um, general health questionnaire type of questions. So this is a more affective kind of measure. Whereas the questions relating to identity are, um, they are I see myself as a very complicated. I see myself as a member of this group. I'm glad to be a member of the group of journalists, for example, as an occupational identity. So I do think conceptually they're very, they're quite different, but definitely they relate. They relate to each other. So um, I mean, the prediction of well being by identity. I I would have to look this up, right? But it's, uh, there are certainly other predictors of well-being. So um, identity, knowing who you are, it's important for effective well-being. And life satisfaction, I have not looked at that. So can I ask another follow-up mm -hmm. question? Did you notice any differences in, um, in identity related to like um, social class or work position? I think that PWG has variables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have not measured that. I have. Mm, I've looked at identification with unemployed people. Not a technical kind of identity as an employed person. I've looked at identification with your team, uh, with your work colleagues, and this seems to relate to precarity. And I had a long time difficulty explaining that correlation. Right? Do you identify less with your co work colleagues if you have more financial worries? You know, it's a finding that's there. We find it over three ways, and I just couldn't make sense of it. I can make better sense of it now, but it's not really enough to say. I think this is really profoundly important. Mm. Uh, no, thank you so much. Yeah, I have so many questions. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> and then here, I don't know yet. So I have, first of all, really thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting, and I really like the angle that you're presenting. So I have two kind of comments and you know, questions related to actually culture because I couldn't stop thinking when we were presenting about um, differences in relation to countries and all the expectations in each country about what job is. And so I was thinking, coming from the south of Italy in which unemployment is very high and the attitude from, let's say, people from my specific part of Italy in which we are okay, even if. So I was just reflecting and if you have thought about about how identity threat in relation to work in precarious employment might be different in relation also to the expectations of what job is for you in that specific country. Totally, yeah, I think mean, yeah, that's a hard point. Um, that reminds me of a study, I think, conducted either in was it South and Italy, I think. Um, of um, people substituting their not work situation with other types of activities that are work like. So I think we need to understand work as a very broad concept. So housework is work, right? Um, volunteer work is work. Peter Moore defines work as every activity that is not done for pure leisure. But watching TV is not work, even if it's tiresome. No. So that's not work. But so not. When we think of work, we often have like the organization full-time employment in mind, but people in, in, in the economies, probably you know that better than I do, are then doing multiple ways of activities. For example, you're then the person responsible for bringing the children to school, right? For a couple of families, that's then your job. That's your work activity, basically. It makes you a member of the community then. It's so, um, what do I have to say here? <laughs> Yeah, I guess there, you know, there are still groups of activities that are connected with expectations and with norms and with belonging. So you might say, okay, I'm, you know, I'm currently uh, out of work, but I'm also, you know, working for the community and I'm on the one who brings kids to school. That's your role. It doesn't mean it for yourself. It doesn't come with a contract or pay necessarily, but it's very informal, very formal role, um, and I think it's still important. So even if you get paid less, right, it's an important role you have for belonging into society, for defining yourself, for knowing where your place is. I was sitting um, 
in Marrakesh on, in a restaurant and they're looking, you know, things going on in the main square, it's fantastic. And then you see people doing all kinds of things to make money, right? To selling something, pulling a card. It, it's great to see. But I think even a person who's on a very, very low job in, in Marrakesh, Morocco, and earns very, very little living, they will feel like, well, I'm doing something, right? I'm part of, part of society. I'm doing an honorable work. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm making, trying to make a living more or less. So I think work and that enables us to do that, even if it's not well paid or something. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, this is a bit digressing. Yeah. Sorry, there, were, there was one question over here, and then, yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, great presentation. Um, I just wondered if you could say something about nuancing it by uh, different types of occupation. I have a sense that for creatives, there are different trade-offs between identity and, and income from maybe different from being an Uber driver, and maybe different again if you're in caring work where you know you could tell yourself there's a social value to what what you're doing. So I just wonder if you could nuance what you're saying by occupation. Thanks very much. That's such an important comment, I think. And and one aspect that maybe sometimes gets a little bit overlooked is the value of identities in what in broader society. So what you're doing will have value. Like we talked about the housekeepers yesterday, who are very low paid, maybe a low status profession, but they know themselves well. It has has value. Or think of dirty work that needs to be done undertakers, for example. So, but still you're part of society. So while doing that job and maybe even having a nice community of workers and getting a reasonable pay might make you less precarious, the social validation from the general societal context makes it different, makes it more difficult, I think. And that's something that needs to be acknowledged as well. So Ashford and Crane have written about this 1999 extensively about dirty work and difficulties it poses towards identity. I'm not saying that anything there is, you know, I think that the term dirty work is a different, different term, actually. But um, perhaps this answers your thing. So, an no, occupation is, of course, meaningful for the person doing it, but it's also in within a context of wider society. And the evaluation of the status and recognition of it is not done independently. So, I'm thinking of illegal professions, for example. Right? You might feel really good of yourself being a very good thief, or being a part, a respected part of the mafia community. But, but still, it, it is a bit of a problem, because in, in a general wider society, this is not respected or even legal, what you might be doing. So, but there's only so much our cognition can bring us to. I would like to do a study among mafia, and um, so if anyone has access to it. Thank you very much. And appreciation. Okay, thank you. And thank you all for being here.